Hello, this is David Herman, alias Daz the Artist, and I've entered the ArtStation Challenge. Uh, I'm going to create something in front of you. Let's see what happens. It'll be a lesson. I am working in Affinity Designer. You see the interface on my screen. So we'll go to File. We're going to go New. And as a new document, I've selected a 16 inch by 9. So like a video format at 300 dpi and I'm gonna and I'm gonna open that up so I have my rulers turned on you can see 0 to 16 in the horizontal and 0 to 9 in the vertical so like a video format next I'm gonna grab an image that I put on my desktop to um, use as a reference and it's going to be this pangolin, because pangolins are in the news. Okay. So then I put that pangolin here, kind of scale him. And let me uh, move this over, kind of move this more into the, let's see here, like that. And uh, yeah, let's hope we that's big enough because I'm going to make him part robotic, I think, and part so I'm going to say okay, uh, so that's going to be good. Crop like that. Let's uh, let's get our hand and see if it moves the whole file. Yes, it does. Perfect. Okay, so there's kind of and if I wanted to move that even more, I could grab that and and uh, like that. That's kind of good there. Okay. So there's my reference. I'm going to save this. File. Save as. PangoBot. Let's call him PangoBot. For ArtStation. challenge and we'll save that to the desktop mm -hmm. and I'm going to go OK now I'm going to create some layers so this guy is the bottom layer above that we're going to do uh, some bloom and a sketch and everything else. So just real quickly, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this and I'm going to take the opacity down. I'm gonna, first I'm going to fill up this uh, like so. I want to find the opacity right here. Let's see what pan does. Okay, that just takes it back and forth the same way the slider does. Um, Right there. And then use hand to bring it back to the center of the screen, kind of. And then I'm going to change the opacity on that right here, where it says opacity in the right hand side. So I'll lighten that up a little bit. So it's like a ghosted tracing paper. And then I'm going to go to my next layer I've created. And I'm going to put some of that bloom in the background. I'm going to do that with a uh, Airbrush. So you have two options. You have Designer Persona, which is this blue pencil logo. And then with the pixels, you have the Pixel Persona. And we're going to use Pixel Persona, pick a brush, and do some airbrush background. And we're going to use uh, Pencil. And then I'm going to select one. And then I'm going to kind of play with the colors and get a background bloom going. So kind of similar to what they have. And then we'll, we'll play with it. Okay, and I'll do a sketch. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm on that layer now. And I intend to do some brushing.
Okay, and I'll save that. And then I'm going to come over here. And I'm going to see if that worked. So you turn this off. You see we got those brush the brush in for the background just a little bit. We're just going to put some quick bloom in. And I'm going to use some bright stuff and some light stuff and just kind of move around. And uh, add some bloom. And that's what we call it. So it's like an out of focus background that we're building up. And then I put a sketch over it. But I'm right now showing you how I create my own. that and I want this to be a little redder you know you get into mobs you can get into whatever color you like I might add a little blue in here jungle stuff you know like some blue lighting And so if I turn this off, you can kind of see I have this soft background swishing around right now. And uh, it's got a textural quality to it. It looks like there's a tooth to the paper and so on. All right. So let me save that. File, save it, save as. And we call it this file. And we're going to save that. And I'll say you have it. And we say OK. All right. Now we're going to do a quick sketch over that, then I can turn off the reference for a minute. So I'm going to call this, uh, this is Bloom Layer. Go Bloom. And I'm going to call this sketch in front of you. Now this is working at real time. This is part one. As I enter the, the uh, challenge. Never done one of these challenges. Hopefully, I'll see this all the way through. If not, I may have to bail out. <laughs> Seems like things happen to me. All right, let's go into black. And let's dial that brush way down. And let's make sure we're on an interesting pencil. Maybe something like this. We'll check our flow and everything. So the opacity is 100. I want to set that back to about 80-ish. Take the flow, make that about a third of that. Take the hardness way down to like nothing almost. And then I'm going to do my line work very quickly. So I have, uh, so you can see, we got to pick a color, make sure we're on a Let's see there. Black, yeah, that should be good. Let's turn this layer off for a second and see if we can see the lines. The lines are very weak, so um, we're going to check something on that. airbrush and our opacity is 88 25 let's bring up the flow and leave the hardness and try that again just so you can see how that works there we go so take that down a little and now I'm using it like a charcoal pencil just to rough in uh, a sketch. I keep dialing it down until I'm more like a sketch pencil. There we go. And then this is working with 
pressure. Just to give us a good start, you know, see where the information is. And then I will eyeball looking at the art. the creature itself, but I'm getting a good start here, okay, and we're just going to come down a little, there we go, so let's, let's get some of these scales in, it's all just reference to, you know, save some time I'm doing this video for you at real time so you may see exactly how long it takes me to do something like this and we're going to uh, just get off the smallest size pressure thing, we want the stabilizer off, so there we go, now it's pulling the pencil, we want that off, and there we go, let's see, yeah, so there's different functions in Affinity Designer and some let you see the drag. We don't want that right now because that is slowing down the process. This is speeding it up much more. So now you can watch me just rough in a creature. Very rough. A few key factors. You can see that the armor plates are like turtle shell or something. They're very, 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 uh, rigid and bumpy and curved. They're convex. You know, they curve outward. And uh, then you have its strange head shape. And like I say, we're just getting the basics down. So, you can watch me. And this is part one. I assume it's going to take a little while to create this tutorial. Maybe two, three parts. I will label them all when I upload this. You know, it's also like an artichoke. You know, the, the vegetable. It's delicious with the... Uh, you boil an artichoke or steam it and then put lemon butter on it. Very tasty. I go around my artichokes and cut all the points off. It's a little food prep. And then... Uh, put a double boiler together. I'll just take one of those mesh things that look like artichokes that you open up made out of metal and put that in a pan of uh, boiling water and make sure that the artichoke is submerged sitting in the pan and steam the heck out of it for like 45 minutes and then eat my artichokes. But this armor definitely reminds me of an artichoke. Also the armadillo. So a very curious creature and very suitable I think to make something that looks robotic and at the same time realistic as this develops. Obviously you don't want this to take a minute and a half sped up video. You want to see me really do what I do. So you know how to do it. It's supposed to be an informative tutorial.
And I'm keeping it kind of loose because that's the way I, I'm working at the moment. Once I get drill it down and get uh, very intense, let's do a save, by the way. Save document. Uh, as time goes on, you know, I will work up detail like crazy. But I'm going to show you how I would start this out. You know, someone said to me, like, today I need a pangolin drawn up very quickly. And I want it to look cool and I want it to be part of a robot. And I'm giving you artistic license to uh, dream it up. This would be what I'd do. I'd begin like this. And the reason I'm kind of throwing this thicker pencil in is I'm thinking of it as the shadow. So it represents like a dark drop shadow. And then I'll extrude, I'll find the color above it and detail things up. But we're going to get this going so you can see me turn off the art. And then I'll use the reference on the other screen to color. And it does have a tail. So this uh, armored tail is what you're seeing out here. Just a curious animal. You know, again, like a platypus or something. You just don't know where the heck these things evolve from. How they got like this. Why animals have armor and some don't is just completely random. <laughs> you know, these are formidable creatures. I mean, they've got some sharp nails. All right. I'll come down with the branch. We're going to outline the leg. It's got these three toes. Kind of curled up. Uh, like so. And that branch. See, we've got a nice art line. Then some ter characteristics about the branch. Heard me taking a yawn in there. And this branch actually is our uh, kind of a scratchy looking branch, like the armor. Uh, oddly enough, I'm sure there's, I forget what country these inhabit. But their tree uh, reminds you of the penguin. Okay, let's do some striations, just to know it's circular bark kind of a thing. And save that. And then let's uh, turn off our reference. Okay, so see how we did that? We've got something to go by very quickly without trying to freehand all that stuff. And, you know, this would be maybe nothing compared to uh, the final right okay so let me uh, bring up my reference on the other monitor and now I'm going to kind of uh, fine-tune this so I'm going to go up to uh, the next one and I'm going to do uh, some fine-tuning And I'm going to save this. So file save. Okay. Now, let me work up an interesting head. And I'm going to go into basic instead of pencil. Right there. And I'm going to select uh, a basic brush but it's like a line but uh, just a fuzzier kind of a brush and I'm gonna just shape the nose in here a little bit which is a very curious 
thing. So we're gonna. So you can always bring up your reference, see. And you can see where the nose is. And if I look off camera, it's kind of a shape like this. I want to give you a color. You get the black. I want to be, uh, let me undo that, I just drew on the uh, penguin layer, but it's not a big problem. This is one thing you can learn also, you want to be thinking about your layers. So uh, we're going to bring up the opacity. to 80. See how that looks. Maybe even 100 on this case. Let's do that. Okay. And then I can see some more of that. And I want to be working on my fine tuning layer. So let me click up there. I've got the brush. And I'm going to shape some of these parts in the nose. Just see, there we go. So I'm going to, it's kind of a circle thing, like, uh, like that, four parts, kind of a curious. We want to be less uh, dense, so we can go to maybe 69, 70, something like that, okay. And we've got our line, and we're just, now we're kind of zooming in on the, uh, more detail. And if I want even a softer look, uh, I can take that down in detail in opacity. And blow in some uh, air, black air in there kind of get this going. Then this nose kind of comes back this way. Kind of fits to the head. And blocking the side kind of like that. Because we're going to make kind of a semi-bot, semi-creature. Make sure it touches off. Okay. So my hand doesn't interfere with it. If I turn off the background, you can see what I've got going here now. See? Okay. And just uh, defining the details a little bit. a strange creature. Very strange. But this is how you might get going if you're me. So now I'm going to uh, turn off the background. And I'm going to work a little bit of the detail now that we've got something started. We'll do a save. Okay. And let's start with the head and work our way back. And I'm going to just move around uh, different tones I like and do different things. Okay. And we're just going to see what, what we come up with. So I'm drawing over the other layers. Uh, Kind of a wash. 
as I start to bring up detail into my hangover. Now I'm going to do a head that's going to be kind of robotic. Now we've got the idea. I didn't have to get into super detail. But now I can do something very interesting if I'm careful. And then I'll work my way back, you know, because you can get lost in these drawings. You want it to be a, a penguin, you want it to be electronic or robotic or something kind of following your your heart and your soul and you're creating and you don't really you know I don't really what I call uh, no preconceived notion means exactly that to me when I sit down I don't really want to force myself to do something specific I want my sit down, I know I'm doing a penguin. I know I'm doing a penguin that's going to be part robotic. And I know I'm trying to find an interesting uh, texture overall for the finished product. But I do not want to say it has to look like something else. So now if I want to erase, let me show you how that works. We'll go uh, back to this other layer. We'll get our eraser. We're going to erase some down here under the, the snout like that see you can watch me start to develop this penguin doing amazing stuff with the digital pens and then back to my fine tuning layer wherever those marks are they're on one layer or the other good to get this in your mind when it's short I mean of layers not too many layers and you know try and keep it fresh looking try and keep it organized uh, if the head looks a little bit wide you can taper that down you can draw a new line if you wanted With your pencil brush, I mean, sorry. A little more elongated. Seems to come across like that, the feel, and then this way, the feel. So we'll do that. We'll come here, and then we're going to kind of go like this, where it all bounces together, and save that. Let's do some eye work. Round it out a little bit more. It's not a completely round opening. And it is like a skin flap that kind of cuts across. And you're looking into a lower section. Like that. It's kind of sacred geometry spiral. It's a very interesting optical illusion is what it is. It's totally a spiral. So we would come around like this. I like sacred geometry, very important. And I put that in like this, and then it comes like this. And then it comes around, and it goes actually into the eye like that. So you can kind of spiral it that way. Quite mystical. So I'm coming this way around. See if I can do that. Bring this to here. And then erase this line. There we go. So you see how that spirals around? So cool. File save. Oh boy. We got time to get this project done, but I could see where it's going to be a good one. <laughs> All right, let's make this robotic ear a little more interesting. So I'm going to, uh, and so you see what I did? I'm erasing and I'm shadowing and I'm drawing. I'm creating some line work. 
but I'm working with one brush right now and just varying my opacity, my flow, and my hardness. So how do I think about opacity and flow and hardness? I did traditional airbrushing at one time. If you've done that, opacity refers to your pigment, in my opinion. That's the paint. Flow is the air. And hardness is how forceful that air and paint is coming out of your airbrush. So if you think of the opacity as, do I want 75% of my color? And uh, when I pull back, how hard do I want it to come out? You might say, oh, I don't want it to come out harder than the uh, pigment. So I'll take that down. And then that's the force of air, the mixture of paint, the air and the paint mixing, and then how hard it launches out of there is your hardness. And so that's kind of what you do. And then we will do some ear work. I like that spiral I've got started for the eye. And this is where I kind of, you know, there's some, see, I can erase. I can go back to my brush. This is where I, um, I kind of get myself into the zone. It's hard to do when you're talking and describing. You know, I could be real clever and edit all these things and make them look so professional and awesome. Which is cool. Everybody does it. But I do not. And the reason I do not is if I make an error in this tutorial, you're going to see that error. And you're going to see how I fix the error. Because that's important to me. Now, I'm, I make a little modification. I have this piece hanging over in the front. It doesn't do that in the real creature. Because we're, uh, we're going to modify this like a bot, you know, into uh, some shapes. So this could be like a sensing, uh, some kind of a design robot that, that, you know, looks like a pangolin that's going into a mission uh, to sniff something out, to hunt down a rat, <laughs> a real rat. I have to take a little uh, eraser, take some of this tip down in the front, see how I did that. And that's, that's one thing, when you're working on destructive, you're working on layers, and you know how to erase with a pencil, of course. To me, to me, the most important transition for me as an old guy into the new ways of digital art, from being a traditional artist, a mixed media guy that worked primarily on canvas, MDF board, and 100 pound uh, crescent cardboards, was to, to think in terms of, I want to do what I do traditionally, but know how to find those tools in a software program digitally. So this is what I showed you. I did a bloom. I just sprayed down a little color for the background. Then I went in and did a pencil sketch with maybe some vine charcoal, that thick black, or a <coughs> black prisma color, you know? And then I came in and I started working back and forth, let's say, with chalks, pencils, airbrush. That's how I create. And I'm going to develop this head up some more. Let me just file save. Because it's crucial to save that and not lose that. And we're going to do a little more airbrush work here. And then you know, I'll get into some of this color, too, in his head. Let's do that at the same time, and then I'll work my way back. I don't work with a palette. You have an eyedropper that can definitely pick up color. So if you wanted a little, you know, blue, let's, uh, you can, you know, wasp that in there, like, wisp it in there, I mean, like there's a, uh, I'm thinking of a waspy insect, but wisping it in. That's what I would be doing with an airbrush. Just kind of that sound, you know, tss, 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 as it's sprayed in. You get that highlight. You see already how that changes the image? A little bit here, a little bit there. Something to keep in mind uh, as an old school guy is when we add highlights, there's many ways and tricks to do things. But primarily you're thinking of this, especially with chromes and with, because we're doing a, a bot-like head that's going to be 
part organic and part machinery. Everything above the horizon line, if you imagine an hori um, imaginary horizon line of this creature, would reflect the sky down. So that would be blues and yellows and crimsons and oranges and stuff that you see in the sky. Everything below that would be browns and blacks and dark colors to give it the metal reflections. So now we've kind of got this. Let's save this. I think that's a very good start for you to see how I began the drawing. I took a reference in, I started with a blank piece of paper, I laid my reference down like I had tacked it down, then I put like a tracing paper over, I did my bloom, just a rough background, so I have that in my mind, and then a sketch and some fine tuning sketching, and I kind of jumped back and forth with colors and things in between the two layers. You can always move a layer. So to reiterate the fact about non-destructive, let's say I turn this layer off, you can see the sketch disappeared, right? So if the customer wanted me to change his background, I could go into the background. If I turn off the fine tuning, there's the sketch, but you don't have all that nice artwork, right? I put some of this, uh, if I turn this layer off, you can see the colors on that one also, it's an undercolor like. Now I'm going back to the fine tuning layer and I'm gonna work on it, okay? So, uh, to make this more machinery, when I'm making an organic, I have it more soft. This is just me. When I make it look like machinery, I have more high contrast. Those are basic rules. I think they probably still teach in school. I haven't been in school in a long time. I have served a four-year apprenticeship in lithography, became a journeyman uh, many, many years ago, and in the field of printing and then worked my way up till I was a self-employed print production manager back uh, you know I left that oh 21 years ago when I became a tattoo artist but prior to that I had done you know 15 years in the uh, print production business before they had computers and digital art and then it's we segued into that the first machines that I worked on digitally uh, was called a Cytex, and it was a very, 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 very primitive machine compared to what I have in my house now. And it cost a million five hundred thousand dollars. Had to have a temperature control room, <laughs> and it cost twenty-five thousand dollars a piece for the company to train us in that. Of course, it drove the company out of business because it was so hard to get business. Uh, you know, people to experiment with it when none of the operators knew what they were doing and people didn't know what to do with it anyways because they said, well, what is it? <laughs> so an entire machine that you see like in a Twilight Zone movie where they have the wheel to reel to reel tapes, 9 millimeter tapes going around them and the whole room is temperature controlled and under the floor is all the wires and ribbons and stuff like that. That machine was like... 40k. <laughs> it took hours and hours to do a 9 by 12 image. Giant files, tons of film. We wasted so much material because not even the manufacturers knew how to manage, what to do with them once they created them. Then of course the desktop revolution came about and over the years it kept getting more refined and more refined and more refined and I did all my artwork and stuff on a light table construction on a light table and uh, you know with film and uh, tools we use magnifying glasses we use scratching tools we cut the hair off our brushes to make stipple brushes each guy had just his own collection of tools and airbrush stuff and everything and so that's how we did it till and then people said to us well you know the digital age is coming you guys are all going to be dinosaurs and be replaced and we said what you can't do this stuff with a machine. I don't even think when they initially started to write software for these things that they had any idea the level of sophistication we would get to today. I worked on an Intuos, Intuos Pro tablet just for five years and the first two were like just learning eye-hand coordination where I 
finally could look up at my reference without looking down at my slate and draw. And then after five years of that, I said, you know, I've got to draw in glass. This is this is just too cumbersome. I mean, it, you can do it. Everybody does it. They can't afford it. But uh, I looked at all the brands on the internet, and every you watch the videos, you see where they have shortcomings, what the artist doesn't know, what the machine can't do. It takes a ton of research, and then for me, I finally. Um, got the courage to go to uh, Portland, Oregon, to where Wacom has a welcome center where you can bring your own computer or laptop in there, desktop or laptop or tablet, and hook it up to any of their equipment. And that way you have your own software that you typically work in, and that time I was working in Photoshop and working in uh, Paint, Paint Storm, or uh, all kinds of little programs before I got into Affinity Designer and tested it all out. And then I said, I, you know, I'm going to just charge it. I've got to do it. I've got to do it. So then I got myself the Wacom 24-inch Pro tablet, which I don't regret. It's just that my laptop doesn't have enough power in the graphics card and the graphic card can't be replaced to use the um, full 4K. But I use 2K on the monitor. We're just getting some of this roughed in here while I'm talking. And trying to stay on the right layer. I'm going to do a save and then I'm going to get into some serious more black here. Let me do a file save. And yes, this will be in a number of parts. Obviously, I would take me sit here for hours. So uh, let me get down to the black, and I'm going to do a um, a brown black. So I'm going to find on the outside of the wheel between red and yellow, you have your orange, and then if you rotate towards the red, it gets a little darker up here in the brown, a nice rich brown. I'm going to. Put some of that underneath, just a little. I want to start to get the um, what do you call it? I want you to feel the form, whether it's convex or concave or stuff like that, and. Uh, See, now he's robotic a little bit, and I'm going to articulate it with some, some nice line, nice lines, and then I'm going to stipple it a little bit and do some things, but let's just, before I get my optical illusion tool out, that's my brain, get this going. So if I stop talking for a minute, it's just because it's, to be honest with you, I have to think about drawing. I'm not going to, you know, I don't do voiceovers. I don't do edits when these are done. And let's enlarge the head a little bit, right? So we'll go to the magnifying glass tool. We're going to bring this up and we'll move this over nicely to where we can work on it in the middle. And you can see I've got like an Archimedes spiral of lights going around the eye and some stuff here and still keeping the integrity of the pangolin, um, which is a good feeling. And, and again, I start to get into optical illusions and tricks I do. So here, uh, one of my things as an artist, and I did all this in hard painting you know I did it in like you know not digital but like painting on canvas I can do way more digital than I can on canvas to be honest with you because it's just too time consuming and when you actually weigh the cost 
Now, I don't sell any of my art yet, but it, it'll get there. Um, when I weigh the cost of, you know, pencils, pens, airbrush, paints, gouache, oils, acrylic, and all that stuff against the tablet, tablet comes out cheaper even if it's 3000 bucks. You know? Because you just need so many materials. And then when you go to draw, you get into the ritual of setting up and all that stuff. <laughs> and it's a, just a procrastination that I didn't realize I, you know, was into. You know, you spill your watercolor, you, you blame this, you blame that. It's all yourself. And it just takes... I'm so glad I'm transitioning over to digital. I really appreciate the technology. I'm going to cry if the electricity ever goes out. Believe me, I'm going to be crying for days. But should the grid go down or something. Right now, I, I have my, uh, just for you and me as a reference, I have my internet turned off. Uh, I'm starting this on June 12th. And in nine days would be my birthday. So um, I have really dedicated myself to getting to a certain point this year. And then there was COVID and then there was my business. And then, I, you know, I, I'm like a human, like everybody else. I had to have an emergency eye operation in the middle of the COVID uh, six weeks ago. And just, you know, life always challenges us. And that's sees what you're made out of you know so it's my first challenge after this uh one of the guys at uh, art station that i communicate with uh because i'm an um, i didn't go to the digital art school so uh, for the technology the modern age i do have questions you know and I'm, I'm a quick learner if somebody explains something to me enough where i can take the ball and run with it and do all the other things I do in life. I like to hike and camp and bicycle and kayak and write. And uh, I keep myself active. Okay. So now you've watched me. And we're kind of like hanging out. I want to... Oh, I want to close that. I want to save it. I thank God that computers think that much for you and says, Hey, you're hitting the wrong button, Dave. <laughs> Don't do that. Yes, sir. Thank you for saving my butt. Other times I close it and then I'm like, what did I just do? Okay, so now we're enhancing this metal. You're watching me do my own uh, metal. You know, there's a lot of, everyone has their own look to stuff. Everyone, uh, you know, copies guys and gals and so on. Uh, to the, this is kind of a, like a puppet error. You know, things look more like puppets to me than, uh, than uh, art. They have kind of like a, the anime puppet look all valid forms of art but you know I have a different way of doing stuff and I'm going to do that so you're kind of watching me uh, on the fly yeah and other people like to rush and I have to say that for me uh, art is a, is a moving meditation and it just, when you get in that zone where you're spiritually, and I don't mean spiritually like religious spiritual, I mean like connected to the cosmic, where you just feel one with life and everything, and you're happy, and you're in that zone, and you're creating, and it's, it's, it's starting to flow, like right now. Right now we're kind of there. You know, you, you watched it. It takes a long time. There's no editing. And the reason I do that is, if you're someone who's watching this, you can play this over and over. You can say, well, what did he, what did he do? I remember something he did. And what was it? Well, if it's, it's just fast editing, and then you, you see it go 30,000 strokes, and then all of a sudden there's a glossy mark. You don't understand how the artist did that. I am doing this live. <laughs> no edits. No edits. There won't be any edits in this. I want you to see. See, I made something on the left uh, above, and I'm making something on the right that compares to that, because I just found something, you know. 
Again, these eyes could move around like chameleons. So why would I um, want to limit myself? So I'm going to open this up now, a little bit like a crack in the bottom of this cable, or whatever this is that a higher life form has used to make this imaginary... Uh, you know, I don't even know what to call these things. I think of them as being part organic, part biology, part metallic, part um, crystal, part machine, part anything. And, you know, when it's a human, I call it like a transhuman. I just, like you've taken a human and put parts in them and pierced them and, you know, tattoo them and stuff like you do that, except you're taking his eardrum out and putting in a speaker or something like that. So uh, there's got to be a name for like the total uh, combination of technology and organics. Because look, let's say you just started in a lab, right? You're building this and you're a high life form and you just said, I'm making one of these. Uh, you know, get out mold number seven. <laughs> Dip it, put it in the Petri dish, grow a mold on it so I get that kind of thing I want going. And then uh, let's add some polished steel and some exotic metals and whatever else would be going into it. So, uh, most likely, it would be so far even bizarre that that I don't I don't know what they would create. But we need a name for like that kind of a thing, because we only have a very small. The word I'm looking for vocabulary to describe. Uh, these technologies and it, it's going to be so far advanced compared to a human when we ever meet another species there's evidence for sure all right so focusing on the art as an artist i do mind wander but i'm drawing live for you you're getting to see that and you're getting to see how i modify it as i fly along I leave the interface up so you can see everything and you can slow it down if you have to. Uh, speed past it. You know, you have your timeline. I don't know how long each episode of this will be. Let me check my monitor just to see what the time is. Because I don't want to go more than like an hour and a half in a session, I think. So we're an hour. Yeah, you know, we can go two hours maybe. And I'll be a part. Um, let's see. There's my drawing in the background at home. Uh, oh, I closed publisher. Holy cow. What was I doing? I hit the wrong button. Now watch. Publisher will open. Not a problem. <laughs> We're not going to work in publisher. You have to excuse me. <laughs> let me close that. And let me go back to designer, which I closed by accident. This is so much fun. I'm not going to win the contest, but I want to show how I draw. So it's not a big deal. I make lots of mistakes. And I used to get so freaked out about perfection. Because when you're an advertising executive like I once was, uh, we didn't even have, I mean, open recent. Let's see what we got. There, there we go. So it's, it's still good. That's why we save as we go along. And now we're going to go back into our detail. Mm, right there. Okay, move that over a little bit. See, it's a, it needs a little bit crispier than it needs to be. So, if you need to know uh, what your actual size is in Affinity Designer, you go View, Zoom, and 100%. 
So that is output size right there. 9 by 12, that's the actual size. We're working way bigger to create super detail. And then I can go back to, I can zoom it to uh, 200, 400, and so on. So let's just zoom to 200. And there we go. Nice. All right. The white highlights didn't show because I messed up and closed it by accident. <laughs> oh, man. Don't watch everything I do, people. But you know what? You're going to do this. That's the thing. You will do it. And rather than panic, you can say, well, I watched that guy. Uh, what was his name? It was, uh, oh, yeah, David Herman, alias Daz, the tattoo artist. And he messed up. And he didn't have a heart attack. So I'm not about to have a heart attack. You know? That's right. Just... Just do your thing. Uh, these things should be off. The length of rope, we don't want any rope. That should be a zero. It's like a vector tool. Okay, back into drawing. Make sure touch is off. Touch can be a problem on these touch monitors your hand touches it. I don't wear a glove, by the way. So uh, by not wearing a glove, I'm not sure what's happening here. I think we need to save, maybe. drawing. There we go. Just subtle stuff. Some highlights here and there. So bring this is this is the most the closest to the viewer. So something I think about is among the many things, is if you want something to look closer to the viewer, that's going to be brighter, of course. And if you want something to be further away from your viewer, it's going to be darker, or have more shadow, or, you know, catch just a glint. See, this is just catching a glint on this uh, hard surface. I, this, I'm distinguishing that this is some kind of a hard surface. I, I don't know if it's a coil, if it's a wire, whatever it is, it's it's artificial, right? I don't want it to look organic in this case. Because this is like an aperture of a camera or something that would open and close. And uh, thinking how to accent this properly in the circle. See, so I'm, I'm making it come forward. Then it's, it, it's socketed in some kind of a purple gasket kind of a thing. So I can, uh, you know, you're thinking about parts. You are. When you draw, it's not just like uh, I'm drawing something. you got to think about, like, the reality of it, I think. You know, uh, this is more of a fuchsia, deep fuchsia. So... I do. I think about, okay, this is nested into this part, and so on and so forth. See how it's yanking that pencil? We don't want the pencil. Let's try something here. Symmetry, rope length, that's where it, what happened. The rope length should be zero. Enter. Zero. Enter. Zero.
too much. Some of these buttons are hit, have been hit with some other things, and we're just okay. Uh, okay, so now some more highlight right here. Actually, save file save. Make sure everything is cool. Hundred percent flow. I want that flow up. I want to be able to see that capacity. And software has a tendency to do its own thing. <laughs> This is the setting of the original pencil when I put it up. So when I reopened the program, it changed all the nice metrics I had set up there. Right? And that was my bad because I accidentally closed this while I was working. But if you do that, you know, say you're on a commission job or you're on your own project or you're, you're doing something and you screw up you could spend a year trying to figure out what happened. I leave this stuff in here to help anybody. You know, you can play it back and just watch me dial the knobs. And uh, should you experience the same type of a uh, faux pas, you know, a mistake. Yes, I admit, I make mistakes. And if I even work for somebody else, I'm going to make mistakes. It's nice to be working in your house. Nobody has to see that. But, you know, I wouldn't hide it on the job anyways. I would just say, yeah, just guess what? I accidentally shut that. <laughs> I'll get it back or I'll redraw the whole thing. But that's why I'm showing you what I do to recover from an error. And I'm not intentionally making these errors. <laughs> I'm my own worst enemy at times. You know. Try and keep a sense of humor. It's very important. And so this is a nice spiral. We have also the effect of uh, kind of the artichoke feel, octopus kind of a arm. Uh, you know, there's things I'm thinking about when I'm not talking but that lend itself to, uh, so you're making something, you, you want it to look like something. And people don't know what the reference is, but they know it looks like something to them. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, okay, that's like an octopus, or this is like a, a steel cable, or this is like this. And then I work on that and get that feel. Now let's say I wanted an interesting eyelid over that, right? And I want to keep that separate. So I go to the next layer. And I could call this eyelid for now. And uh, say I wanted a transparent kind of a bluish, yes, teal like that. Let's use that for instance. And just kind of went across like that. Just thinking about what that, you know, it's kind of a texture. What do I want to do? Okay, so I get it like that. Then I take my eraser and I'll fine tune the edge. And then, since this is like a hazy bubble kind of something, I might, you know, get down and articulate that edge a little bit so it's like vacuum sealed. You know, you get that feeling that something's vacuumed tight. It's, you know, like a sclera. Something's on there that you can't tell what's going on, but there's something going on there, see? And now it kind of references, it kind of reads 
to the opposite side of the page. And I can work up, you know, some stuff into that, right? So I go to the other eye, where I want to do some kind of chameleon looking stuff like that, right? And uh, now I'm going to change this to eyelids. And we're going to go over to the other one and do some articulation through the sclera there. Or the coating, you know, watch. I will um, get my brush. I'll kind of do some things like this, see. And your mind will make this work. Your brain will make it say, oh, okay, now I'm looking through the far eyeball. And this is how I'm working on the fly. Now, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea. But then something just happened now. I got in the zone as the artist. I'm feeling, you know, like we're making progress. I had a big <laughs> accident. Accidents I have turned into inspirations. I don't freak out. Uh, it does you no good. You lose your energy and everything for nothing, you know. If you're in a studio, you'd be walking around throwing stuff at your painting and kicking cans on the floor. And, you know, when you work digital, you just go, hey, okay, I'll fix it. Because there's no point to lose your mind. You really, you can't have the kind of fun losing your mind digitally that you could when you had it in a studio with uh, hard stuff going on. <laughs> so, say I want to soften some of that stuff, you know, I can use this... Uh, I go over here to the brushes, this nut, there's a, uh, let's click on some of these, you got the blur tool right there, and you can take that and just soften some of those edges, like if I was using Conti Crayon for this in the real world, I would take a Q-tip and I would soften that edge, see, and that's how I think. Then I might want to erase some more of this edge around the face here. So I'm going to go back to my uh, sketch first, go around the border of this head and see if that catches it. If it doesn't catch it, I have to go to that layer above it. It doesn't. So it's on my fine tune layer. And that's how I stay non destructive. See, I'm detailing. I thought, you know, I better detail something while I'm thinking about it. take the thickness of this far border down, you know, from my sketch. I assure you, every professional artist in the world works like this. They, they're going through the same gyrations you and I are going through. And uh, they just edit the video and then they look like genius. But they'll tell you themselves, you know, this is a mess. This is a freaking mess to try and try and keep your hands on, you know, kind of keep a handle on everything. Uh, this is why there's layers, though. You see, I've been able to super modify and clean, and, and that's why it's non-destructive. You know, I haven't destroyed anything. I haven't made it impossible for me to work. I made it easier for me to work by using layers. It's not working on that one, it's on this one, you know? Because sometimes when I'm talking, I, I'm on a different layer than I think I'm on. But that's not a problem, because I'm on a layer. And the layer can always be found and modified. Look at that. This is starting to get sweet now, see? And I know I don't have a chance in this contest. But I'm going to go through with this contest. <laughs> There's one guy I contact, I won't say his name at ArtStation, he puts up with me. And I really love that guy. He's such a good man, he has a lot of patience. We're throwbacks to a different time. We're from the time that you see on TV called Mad Men. We had to get stuff done that took an enormous amount of man hours before computers, just enormous. And the way you did that was you threw lots of people at the problem, lots of bodies. You had to coordinate all the different personalities. 
it's a wonder any of us uh, kept our sanity that was in that profession. You know, the advertising world, believe it or not, is different than the world you guys are growing up in. Because when we grew up in it, it was one of the highest suicide rates. It was in the top five. Su the suicide rate <laughs> was highest among doctors, psychologists, and advertising executives. And in those professions, advertising people kept their sanity by just getting married over and over and over. Because it was so hard to keep your spouse, you worked you know, 80 to 100 hours a week, you were under pressure, people screamed at you, you had to organize creative people, you had to carry debt, 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 till you got paid. It was just a challenge besides the brilliant things you could do as an, as an artist. You had to solve business problems, you had pressure. <laughs> it was ridiculous. And just like the economy has its up and downs today, it collapsed many times in my lifetime. Many times people lost their houses, their condos, their apartments, their jobs. The auto industry was a five-year cycle. So the computer industry really hasn't experienced it so much. The way they experience it is if there's a blunder, like, you know, Boeing screwed up an airplane. Uh, you know, it takes a long time to solve that, that engineering problem. Somebody was slacking big time. They have to solve those problems. Somebody is going to drill that down. There's going to be a guy like me. That was my job. They'd call me up on a Friday night and say, look, we need to, there's a very important meeting Tuesday morning. We need this 200-pager printed and on the desk by 8 o'clock in the morning Tuesday. There's a room of artists, writers, designers that can't get anything done. They're very close, but no one's afraid to take the lead because they'll, they'll lose face or they got to work with these people every day and they're not going to like each other and whatever. So Dave, we're going to hire you to go in there and be the guy. And so, you know, after you've done it for years, you show up, you have a reputation, and your reputation is you're going to get it done, everyone's going to get a feather in their cap, they're going to look good, and you just show up in the room and you go, well, guess what, the VP of uh, print production at Chrysler just called me, I'm here to help you people, what do you need? And then I get it done. It's like calling the wolf and kill Bill, you know? Uh, or Reservoir Dogs, or, no, not, no, yeah, um, not, yeah, was it Kill Bill? Tarantino's movie, I think it was, not Kill Bill, I'm trying to think, uh, Pulp Fiction, Call the Wolf, so, I was like the wolf, there I go, fast as I can get there, and get it solved, <laughs> whatever the problem was, I'm going to solve it. Unfortunately, after I take the beating for doing that, psychologically, emotionally, financially, it took 90 days to get my money. So, very hard to be an advertising exec back then. Most people worked for companies because they had thousands of perks and, you know, paid vacations and all that stuff. When you're a broker, man, it's just, I don't want to get into it, but it's, you got to have big ones. So, now that I'm semi retired and uh, still love art to the nth degree, you get to see what I do for a couple bucks. Took me eons to be have this ability. File save. And you may not even appreciate any of it, which is fine with me. We're all different artists. I love art, period. Uh, all the arts, you know? Dance, digital, mixed media, music, 
fabric, tapestries, graffiti, signage, you know, there's just, it's all fascinating. The people are fascinating. The culture's fascinating. And it's sad that uh, the world is in a conundrum. But it'll get out of it. Something will happen. There's always some miracle that happens. As much as we like to think they're all staged, they're not. But once it happens, the plundering starts. See, the, dis the taking advantage of the situation always happens. And that's the sad part. And these blue uh, things lit up on the nose there, I don't want them all to be symmetrical and the same, just so you know. Okay? You see how we took that pangolin and we kind of robotic robotic it up. <laughs> Is that a word? Can there be a word robotic? I don't know. And let's make this a little more fascinating. Put some red in there. See how I'm doing this? You watch me do this with a single brush. All these looks. Because what did I do? I, I erased. I varied my pressure. I varied my colors with every stroke almost. I, I did the traditional art stuff, but airbrush wise, I mean, uh, digital airbrush wise, see, so, and I'm thinking of the product itself, you know, my, my, uh, not the product, I'm thinking of the entity, this creature, maybe there's a little lights in these sections, I don't know what they are, it could be f uh, fluorescent, material that's uh, doing this. It, it certainly isn't going to just be an LED and something from another planet, you know. They're going to be using something more like, uh, you know, something from the ocean that you bring it out into the light and this is what you get, the deep sea creature or something that's been hybridized. So, yes, I think of the bazaar. I want you to all be successful and eccentric. This year, I had every intention for my birthday to be on the road. I've been planning and making my Honda Element into a sleeping camper. I can now sleep in it. I now have a, uh, a cargo thing on the back. I'm looking at getting a trailer. I built a portable tiki bar. I was going to have so much fun coming to meet all you digital artists all over the United States, uh, trekking around. And then COVID happened and spoiled my plans. <laughs> and I was going to do it, you know, as cheap as I could in my car. I wanted to meet all these artists at these conventions and discuss. how to get to the dream of working from my house and talking by um, uh, conference calls and never leaving if I didn't have to to earn a living but to go out and meet people at conventions and see the result of our collaborative work or something like that, you know. It all got spoiled. Okay, that's too much pressure, so we're cutting this down because I don't want that to be as bright. All right. There we go. And so I'm texturizing something here. You know, people say bring in a texture. I'm playing with one brush. You're watching me do this all with <laughs> one brush. I'm one brush dazzer. Uh, you know, of course, I've changed it a few times, but. Let's do a save. Especially when you're building a giant file, you have got to do your saves. So these are lights moving below the surface. And to show that, I'll put a gloss over it in a second. But I, 
I started to get colorful because the eyes got me excited with that. And then I'll go to my white, you know, and I will uh, airbrush in like a little more articulation. I just don't want to be that strong. Let me take this opacity down. Mm -hmm. See, it's like a corded knot, like a, you know, and then this will be like three, like, curve that opening, articulate that there, put a little white there, bring this one over. Something's happening as it moves downward, you know. We're not quite sure. This could tie into another one. Like that, and this, and this, and then this can blend in there. I'll save that, and then I'll come back with shadow and work on it. But you see there's a transparency effect now. You clearly can see that. You can clearly see how I have hard surfaces, transparent surfaces, lit surfaces, glossy surfaces, matte surfaces digitally with a very simple technique. Um, it's a matter of uh, the way I work, not the way everyone else does. That's for first part. But I use color, I use shadow, I use line, I uh, create optical illusions. Here's going to be a hole. another hole in there come down like this separate that there's all that going on and then we're going to kind of fuse this now like uh, draw some lines through here just like uh, cementing it together with shadow uh, it gives it depth and makes it believable solid out of it Okay. Now mind you, I'm trying to stay original at the same time. So, there's a lot of thinking going on in my head as I produce these. And it could be totally wrong by today's standards. I'm sure it is. I'm sure someone's going to say, well, that doesn't follow the book. Yeah, well, guess what? It doesn't follow any book. However, it does follow art rules. And it breaks rules. Oh, yeah. Man, this is, this is happening as far as I'm concerned getting there now. Getting there now. Okay, so you're watching me draw for well over an hour now. I will take this uh, first lesson up to two hours. Let me see where I'm at. Let me go back and look at the clock. Oh, 124. Okay, I got a lot of time. So let me save this. And pray that I don't destroy it before I get to two hours. I get to keep my focus. Very difficult. Today is a rainy off and on day, kind of overcast. Uh, in the northwest, I'm in Olympia, Washington, in case you wondered. And I had a nice breakfast out in this little tiki bar I built the last couple of weeks with a buddy commissioned a carpenter friend to get a bunch of his scrap I did a noodle doodle on a like a napkin kind of sketch <clears throat> and we went to work he took the sketch he started it at his house and then dragged it over on a trailer and then we really turned it into something cool like out of the movie uh, Kill Bill or a spaghetti western or a samurai movie, Japanese style. 
very cool made out of scraps cedar and uh, chunks of wood but what started me off on it was he was cutting down a tree behind me that turned out to be black walnut and I said dude I would oh that black walnut is worth a lot of money man you should go on the net cut it up into boards and stuff so he said because you discovered that I will what do you need I said well I need this he said okay I'll help you make that and I will put a black walnut board on the shelf so that's I literally have a black walnut shelf on my little tiny tiki bar that's raw cut from a fresh cut down tree two and a half weeks ago three weeks ago there's no finish we don't have any oils we don't have anything on it we don't have any varnishes or anything because we're still designing as we go and uh, it is so so cool very very cool all right I'm, I'm thinking this out as I go it's getting to look interesting got that bowl kind of a thing in the nose file save so you know somebody might not even know this was a pangolin looking at it then again they might let's take a minute to breathe got those organic metals still look you got to have some depth on the side so let me show them what I do there organic orangey I'm going to fill this in harsh right there uh, to make that lift I'm going to do that in the middle a little bit get some lift and some depth and then I'm going to come back and use some fuchsia make a little highlight it's a little bit dark let's go brighter fuchsia move down the triangle like that like that yeah parts and stuff are weird to think of especially in color and I'm going to do some black line work in here uh, just kind of separate a little bit just not too much you know a lot you do like to leave to suggestion in other words the viewer kind of fills in the gap uh, mentally but he can show a little bit and as another creature you know I want it to be kind of like in a fusion state like it's it's it, it's it's liquid in other words it, it, it can change itself when I'm not looking. So how do I depict that? That's that's the hard part, you know. How do you depict uh, these layers, these cool things? And you have to get in, get in the zone. You're thinking, you're thinking. You know, nobody's nobody's high. This is really thinking. This is really just training the eye. Uh, the hard grunt way just grunt work you know I like it I like it now I'm going to push back some of that stuff and bring forward something and then I'm going to move up into the ear. Okay, so we need a touch of the blue highlights on these sides. Right up here. So, all right. Let's see, like, 
I find the one that's the highest, like there, and here, then I might want to show one there, something in here, like bigger, like a groove, you know, things are show progression, they're flowing, some are long, some are short, and then something is large all of a sudden. Something here, I could bring this down just a little. Draw that focus there. Put a little edge over here where it's lit up below the surface. And again, to make that happen, there'll be some popcorn highlights. Like uh, we call them popcorn. It's just an intense, bright white spot on a shiny surface. Could do that like that. If it's if it's internal or of its own, they would be in not the same. They could be in opposing directions because it's lit up internally, and so it's not the cast light, but it's its own light of the robotics. And so to get that feel is uh, it's, every artist has their own way of doing it. I like to keep my style, and I know what I'm doing with reference to my style. It's a building. It, 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 it's very much building up of uh, stuff from different layers at the same time, different processes, and that looks pretty cool. And then this could maybe be here a little enhanced. And uh, we got that kind of a feel now. Yeah, let's save that. Mm. Very, very cool start. It's a good start right there. And you can see the body and everything. It's going to take, take a while. But the head's really important. And I'm doing that, and I don't want to have any screws and stuff. I want this to be very fluid, plasma-type construction by an alien race of, uh, of things that follow laws in the multiverse. So we wouldn't just be seeing what we see with the naked eye. If the designers lived in a... Uh, if they used ultraviolet and infrared vision, they see the world different and they would construct a different world than us. And to convey that, that it's otherworldly, and not just what a human thinks is otherworldly, but otherworldly. I don't want it to have a normal frame of reference. I want it to be strange this cabling that comes up into here and thinking about the construction itself. Now there's a it's 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 a lot of parts. It's a lot of things. There's not even really good words to describe it. I don't want to sound inarticulate, but it's many things being divided into many smaller things that move but all are part of a one that changes its form by thinking you know purpose driven modifying self modifying self modifying <laughs> self modification self modifying i don't know what the word is but it wills itself to take a different form. And uh, they experiment with that stuff today, uh, with memory plastics and metals and origami shapes that you take a flat shape, fold it into something, train it that it's been folded, uh, unfold it, and it folds itself back into that shape. You know, that kind of a process 
Interesting. And I'm trying to depict some of that in this. Yes, we're looking good. Let's look at that at actual size now. So view, zoom 100. So there's zoom to fit. That's the whole panel. Now you're looking at the head. You see that? It's nice. It's nice when it's smaller. It's all tightened down, got that gloss on that eye that's very bizarre. And now let's look at actual size. So if it was going to print this book, it wouldn't be much bigger. There you go. That's 16 by 9. Legit. You know, kind of cool. Mm -hmm. I love it. So uh, let's just zoom to fit. Then you have zoom to width. So whichever direction it hits first, like if it's enlarging and it hits the, the width or it hits the height first, it'll stop. So, all right, so zoom to width. Uh, zoom to width. It should get a little bigger, but uh, it doesn't seem to be enough. Uh, zoom to width. Okay. I guess it's stopping itself right there. Zoom. Let's do a few zooms. Zoom in. That's what the zoom to width would be. Like it hit the width of that. You can do um, zoom out. Shot. Like that. But you see the smaller the tightening of all that stuff I did now kind of nestles into a nice, nice illustration. I like it. So um, I'm going to zoom to 100. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we have that saved. It's good. Let me check the time. Time is 1.37. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back. Uh, and we will continue with the last 23 minutes of the first hour. Let me try and pause this. And here I am back after a little break. Had some, uh, some coffee, stood outside, fresh air. You know, it's hard to just sit and draw all the time. Okay, so let's finish this up for two hours. we got about uh, 22 minutes to go. So I'm going to start working the body armor. Let me uh, zoom in on that. Let's focus right here behind the head. Uh, about like that. Let's take the hand, move that over. A little bit slow in the grab. Let's see what's going on with the computer. So I think I'm going to um, stop again and then open and close the program. One second, uh, the break might have been too long. Okay, going back live, I uh, closed and opened the program, which gave me control over the uh, everything again. The computer kind of went uh, asleep or something like that. See, so now we got full control. No big deal. All right, let me work some of this body armor up in color. I will come back to the head and everything uh, at a later time when I fuse it all together. But at this moment in time, I feel I got enough of the head done. And then I want to proceed along into the armor of my Pangolin bot, really. So uh, that's my demo. And uh, I just came in from the outside where I had a couple of coffees with some uh, vanilla chai mixed in there. And got the sniffles because it's raining out there and stuff. But let's see what we can do. All right, so overall, the armor looks kind of like a seashell. It has striations going vertically, and it goes from uh, light to dark, actually towards the body. And so we're going to do some quick gray, and we're going to go up to here, and this is going to be the body armor. So let me uh, type in body armor.
think that's how you spell it, armor? Let's see. Good enough. I don't know if it's just the O or O U R or more. Uh, but that's fine. So the gray is more mixed with a yellow. A pangolin's very strange. Kind of like an ochre. So I'm going to get to the uh, kind of that ochre color. Let me find that uh, nice. Looking at the pangolin, it's kind of this way ish. And then the gray is like this. Let's go about there. All right, and we'll turn on the, I'm going to be on the brush tool, so I want to get back to my pixel persona and affinity designer. And there we go. I got full control of everything. Let's brush in a little gray. Uh, got the eraser on. So, uh, oh wait, body armor. Oh, see, the minute I did that, you see that color wheel changed on me. Now, I have no idea why it does that when I flip back and forth. Other than it recalls that was the last color when I was in Pixel Persona. But that's a flaw in your program, I think. It shouldn't do that. Okay? It should go to the color I select. Alright, so no big deal. I could write them a letter. Let somebody else write the letter. It's a secret now, all right? We all know it. All right, getting a gray into here. Some little armor stuff going on. When I have kind of a crinkle, some dents. So. I'm looking at the black as a shadow. The black is a shadow area to me, it's a negative space. As I start to build the tiles of the pangolin's body, the armor, <coughs> transition it into the head, and there'll be lots of stuff going on here. Of course, this hard outline, we're, we're going to get rid of that. You know, there wouldn't be an outline like in life. It just goes right up to the border. You know what I mean? So, like, uh, take some dark and kind of come back into this head like this. You can also use that to work um, the surface, you know? Think of articulating the surface and then coming up like this. Uh, no harsh line, and you got that. We'll separate the background and all that. I'm gonna make my own little, uh, I'll go, yeah, a little bit shape here and there as I build the armor, which, you know, because I'm creating my own thing. Uh, based on the pangolin, it doesn't have to be identical, of course. You know that. And we're going to shape some stuff in here. So you even have the potential of... You're thinking of geckos, you're thinking of rhinos, you're thinking of armadillos, you're thinking of the pangolin. You think of anything that has like an armor plating. And uh, scaling and surfaces like that. And the artichoke, it really is like an artichoke fanning out. So that's important to help you think, right? So you might have this one. Then you go to this one. And you're um, trying to, it's actually spiral. It's not really layers like we think. It's like a spiral coming out. It's so bizarre. The body of the creature is so bizarre. So, just make this one bigger. Kind of articulate them as I go. 
And then I'm going to work three or four of them here, just to show you. So if I get that started like that, each one has kind of like a, an edge. So let's, uh, let's just do like a light, just a very light edge. Um, you can see it's articulated kind of like in the, and it's the color, it's, it's just a very strange edge like that and um, some can be kind of squared off in the beginning like they're broken almost and some are more pointy see and we're extracting some layers as we do this get this going and then there's uh, striations that run vertically so if we went like this And keep them curved, you know, because uh, there's, there's a convex shape to it. So they wouldn't be straight lines, you know. You're going to shape, shape the object by the uh, wireframe line. It's very cool. you got to remember all this stuff, though, when you're drawing. you got to be thinking about all these things. Think, think, think. Then it's more like a seashell, so uh, we're going to enlarge this a little bit to work on it. I want it darker inside, though, so I'm going to come a little bit darker in between. Oh, mine went brush a little darker in between. the beauty of uh, digital art, you can just magnify it and magnify it. This is a 2K magnification. Uh, I can do 4K, but in order to do that, I have to leave my laptop at 8 gigs. But I modified it and put in two more 8 gig boards. I have 24 gigs in the laptop. And I would gladly switch out the graphics card, but you can't do it in that particular model. So I'm not going to invest any more into the laptop. At some point, maybe the end of this year, depending on how this COVID goes, this year turns out. Uh, if I can afford it financially, I will finally upgrade to a dedicated desktop to my Cintiq, you know, it would just be, a, the Cintiq 24 inch will be going to a dedicated laptop, I mean a tower, sorry, desktop, I'm trying to draw and think, and the dedicated desktop will have a very high, I have to find one with a high end graphics card that's not going to change over the next few years, like six or seven, and uh, support all the 4K monitor potential I have here. And then also um, have a lot more memory space and um, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, let me think for a minute. Uh, yeah, right now I have a terabyte drive. I'm probably going to want something with like three terabytes. And it's not going to go on the internet. Like everything I do uh, on the tablet will... It's going to get saved in a different way. I'll make an archive on an external drive. And hopefully keep that uh, dedicated desktop totally dedicated to art. You know, I'm not going to put any apps on it other than the ones I need to draw. 
Let me do a save. There won't be things like my QuickBooks and all that stuff that I have on <laughs> the desktop to run my business and everything like that, you know. So much to learn, so much, so much. And, you know, footing the bill and all that. It's, it's tough, you know. No matter what profession you get into. The thing about computer art is you can reach a point where you don't need to buy nothing. That's for sure. Same thing as carpentry or anything. Once you get your tools all together, you might want that custom Japanese chisel or something like that to enhance. So to think about that toolbox in the future, you have to think about a desktop that's got room for modification. And, uh, you know, I might even buy a used Cintiq engine. Another year, they'll be selling those off. And the engine for this is probably pretty good. But I'm not paying the kind of dough that they want. No way. Ridiculous. Not for the poor man. Rich man, I guess, can afford it. But the poor man, no way. Eh? Three and a half thousand bucks for an engine is pricey. Those things should be a thousand bucks. Just so that artists can get into the field. Come on. Walk them. If you think of all the people you could sell your product to. It's not that it's just everyone has to have a Ferrari. You want great artists, man. That's the whole reason you design this stuff. Let them in. Make it cheaper. Help us during COVID, where people are losing their jobs, living off government subsidies. Uh, you know, I'm just saying the whole world has to kick in. And we can do this. We can make a beautiful thing happen. Let's do it. Let's be beautiful about it all. I did so much, uh, what do you call it, pro bono work in my lifetime, it's ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. These corporations, they got to give something back. They should just flat out say, you know, we're kicking in. We're kicking in. We want everybody to get thousand bucks from us for Chrysler, for Ford, for General Motors. Come on. It shouldn't just go to those execs. Give it back. Now's the time. Be a hero. Be a hero. Alright. So. Building this armor up with the articulations to look cool. And the color. Okay, so there's some scaly pieces now of, um, of what could be uh, come off in sheets, be punched, shaped in the outlines, outlines warped, pieces put together as a, as a mechanical device. That would not be a problem. So we're going to darken some areas. And then I'm going to put a few popcorns in there. Let me just... Uh, Creek women, I'm, I'm looking at how they do that. And the drop shadows are nice. It really, it's, it's a, such a beautiful thing when you get the flow going. When you get that feel going, like in here, it should be very dark. See, right there. And you see how it's very delicately going? It's, it's, That would be the sound if I was an airbrush guy. And then for my frisket, my mask, I'd either be using a French curve or I take the uh, plastic frisket that you cover your board with and just cut my own French curve out of some plastic material with a razor blade. We made our own French curves a lot. It's really nothing. You just cut like a bunch of elongated and circle shapes kind of things out with a, you know, an exacto knife. 
piece of plastic and then just hold it whatever depth you want to hold it away from your board five inches six inches two inches and then you pick a shape and you kind of brush around the shape it's that's how we masked but we masked in three dimensions the brush I mean we held the mask with our one hand closer far from the board and then sprayed our airbrush around it so knowing some of those concepts it's the conversion of that uh, in your brain it's very difficult to uh, digital but once you get your mind around it get your head wrapped around it it's all doable it all starts to make sense and we kind of just crinkle this along like that edge kind of zigzaggy drawing see and I'm starting to get some lift and you can think of the high points and uh, nothing, you know everybody thinks if, if you know what you're doing you can do it so fast so it's no it's it's not just about the speed it's about thinking so right now my battery is warning me and it's coming up to uh, let's make sure we save that there's a chance that this could crash before my two hours I'm gonna force it to go to two hours Okay, power supply, let me check my batteries. You know, it's funny, I don't have any batteries plugged in, but it might mean that the plug is loose. Let me check that. And the computer might want to do something. So let's just save that, we did, right? Good, and let's view on screen at actual. And you see that? You see how nice that looks? That's pretty cool. And the transition can be a little bit better. I'll do that color-wise, but some more drop shadows and stuff. But there's the beginning of the scales, and that looks pretty sweet. So that's just a uh, you know, have to work my way around. Uh, okay, let's go actual. Let's just see something here. Zoom actual, and then uh, hold down the spacebar. Take your mouse, move your picture over by the hand. There's the actual size. If you measured it, let me just put a tape on there. I want to see something. I'm going to take my tape measure. And if I hold it up to the screen, when you say actual, that is it. That is really nine inches. So you can do this. Hit the tab key. Let me show you a little trick. Oh, kapoof. It disappeared. Shouldn't do that. Uh, back up. Designer closed. When I hit the tab key, I must have. Let's check something. This will kill a little bit of time as it builds up. Something weird happened. No baby, we saved right before that, so I'm not feeling depressed. Okay, close. Uh, open recent. See, we got the speed. So get that, and let's hit the tab key again. So I want to be on uh, there. Tab. Wow, tab is closing it for some reason. It shouldn't do that. Uh, tab should just let you turn off your, it should turn off the uh, interface. You know, you should just see the picture. But we'll do, let's see what we can do about that. We're getting to the end of two minutes, uh, two hours anyway, so I'm not going to edit this. I'm going to bring this back up and then close it for us. Let's see. Uh, open recent. Okay. And then uh, instead of tab, let me see what they got. File. I'm wondering if you can... Uh, There's probably uh, a way to turn off the studio. So let's see, right, hide studio, right there. Let's try that. Yeah, see, and it, and it went off. 
So I'm not sure what's causing that. But two, two hours is up, so I'm going to stop it. Thanks for watching this, part one.